Hello everyone and welcome back to Neuroscience Methods 101. Today we're going to talk about electrocorticography, which is abbreviated as EKG. In principle, EKG is quite similar to electroencephalography or EEG, which we have discussed in prior videos. As a quick reminder, EEG is a non-invasive procedure where tiny electrical signals are recorded from the head. These electrical signals originate from large groups of neurons and the signals travel all the way through the skull. Now, EEG signals are very weak and they are heavily distorted by the skull. You would get a much better and precise signal if these electrodes were not placed on the head but directly on the brain. And this is exactly what EKG is. For an EKG measurement, a grid of electrodes is placed directly on top of the cortex under the skull. Of course, that means it requires surgery to place the electrode grid. And therefore, this procedure is invasive and is only done when there is a medical imperative. For example, EKG grids can be implanted in epilepsy patients to identify epileptogenic zones, which are parts of their brains that generate seizures. Identifying these zones with EKG will give surgeons a chance to remove the epileptogenic region without causing too much damage to other areas. Before the initial surgery, where the EKG grids are placed, EEG and MRI scans can help to get a rough estimate of what the best location to place the grids would be. EKG grids consist of small, disc-like electrodes that are placed epidurally or subdurally. Grids and distance between electrodes can vary in size, which depends on the region of interest. Now, in many cases, epilepsy patients who have received an EKG implant will be observed for several days or even several weeks to identify the sources of the epileptic seizures. If a patient gives consent, the time in between can be used for research purposes, as the grids give a unique opportunity to study electric activity at high spatial and temporal resolution. Research protocols on patients with EKG are often quite similar to EEG research and can involve visual tasks, cognitive tasks or motor tasks. Subsequently, event-related responses can be investigated. This means the brain responds to a certain event or action, for example a button press or the observation of a stimulus, can be investigated. Now, the signals collected from EKG do superficially look very similar to EEG signals. However, with a much higher spatial resolution of approximately 4 square millimeters, the analysis can be somewhat more complex. Whereas EEG gives a smooth representation of signals over a large area, EKG signals can differ significantly between neighboring electrodes that are spaced only a few millimeters apart. The exact location of an EKG sensor is very crucial. Signals can predominantly come from a gyrus, the sulcus or even a blood vessel. Altogether, this makes it hard to identify a common neural response across an area. Therefore, during pre-processing of the data, these aspects should be considered. And it can also be sometimes helpful to record EKG and EEG at the same time. Although EKG is spatially superior to EEG and MEG, it is certainly not perfect. Since EKG is placed on top of the cortex, it means that it is very limited in recording deeper parts of the brain. As such, it is not uncommon that patients receive both EKG and stereo EEG or SEEG implants. SEEG records signals from inside the brain through electrodes that are placed on thin leads. These leads or rods have a similar thickness as an uncooked piece of spaghetti and they can be inserted in the brain without causing too much damage. Thereby, signals from deeper brain regions can be recorded. Now, most EKG grids are placed for a short time. However, recent advances allow for long-term or chronic placement of EKG sensors. This allows for the development of EKG-based brain-computer interfaces and closed-loop approaches which can be combined with, for example, stimulation devices. That means that the patient's brain signals are constantly monitored and if an abnormal activation is picked up, stimulation through a small electric impulse can be applied to fix the problem. Another application, in for example patients with movement disabilities, is to use long-term EKG to control prosthetics. In these cases, movement planning signals from the motor cortex are recorded with the EKG, classified and then translated to actual movement of an artificial arm or hand. Anyways, that's it. We hope you enjoyed this explanation about EKG. 
If you did, why not give this video a like? And as always, we hope to see you the next time.